Hello, everybody. Welcome. Thank you so much for being here this evening. I'm really excited to see so many people who are interested in starting new gardens and growing food. Um, so I'd like to start off with just a little introduction about what to expect as we move through this presentation. Uh, we'll start off with a little bit of an introduction to myself and the work that I do to kind of let you know who I am and also an introduction to the techniques that we'll be talking about in kind of an overview format. We'll then move into kind of step-by-step -step implementation. So we really kind of lay out um, the process for being able to establish a garden at your own location. And then we'll also talk about how to use those same methods for creating a container garden. If you don't have access to land, it's still possible to grow food uh, on a deck or a porch or um, on your fire escape. So it's very accessible and can be done at a lot of different scales. And then we'll make sure that we have some time at the end for questions and for um, feedback and more conversation about what we've talked about. So again, my name is Rowan Gorman. And um, as Hillary mentioned, I work at a nonprofit in Portland, Maine called Cultivating Community. We are a food-based nonprofit, and we really believe that access to being able to grow and eat healthy food is a right that everybody deserves access to. And so we do a wide range of programming to try to further that mission, starting with elementary school student programming right up through providing support for new American farmers who are growing at a commercial scale. And as Hillary mentioned, my role in that work is um, to uh, manage a network of 11 community gardens throughout the city of Portland in collaboration with the city and to oversee other urban growing sites within the city of Portland and work to support families who are growing food for themselves um, on a smaller scale, not a commercial scale. So the technique that I'm going to talk to you about today is often called lasagna layering, which is kind of a funny word. Um, I gets into this idea that we're using a lot of different materials to create these new garden spaces. Really what this is talking about is a way to uh, make an established raised beds. And it's also a form of no-till gardening, might be another word that you've heard mentioned. Um, so this is in contrast to some other methods that would use tractors or rototillers to be digging and turning over the soil. So every technique and every approach to gardening, there are many of them out there and they all have pros and cons. So it's definitely something to experiment with to find out what works for you and what works for your site. Um, this is the method that I've found uh, has the most uh, pros for me and has created the most productive spaces using the least amount of resources and creating the most productivity. So that's why I'm going to share this one with you today. Um, it's really focused on building healthy soil. And if in the act of building healthy soil, we're going to be creating healthy plants and having a healthy diet that we're then able to consume. It's also a relatively low impact in terms of the environmental um, resources that are utilized. So a lot of the materials we'll be talking about today are often part of a waste stream. And so they're available for free or for very affordable prices and they would otherwise um, be underutilized or thrown out. Um, so this is a way to redirect those resources to really regenerate the quality and health of the soil and plants uh, at your home instead of um, bringing in imported topsoil that's scraped off from somewhere else. So 
So I thought I would just introduce you to some of the tools that I find helpful for this method of gardening. Uh, it's nice in that it's accessible, so it doesn't require any more expensive mechanical tools. It doesn't rely on purchasing a rototiller or any fancy mechanized equipment. Um, the first tool on the screen is called a spading fork. This is really nice for um, aerating the soil, moving materials. Um, the second tool is a mulch fork or a manure fork, and that's really great for moving any kind of wood chips, grass clippings, kind of coarser materials. Um, a long-handed shovel is a really nice tool for um, moving finished compost and finer materials. And then just a couple of five gallon buckets can be really useful to be gathering and moving around some of the materials we'll be talking about. So um, in addition to that, sometimes just a hand trowel when you get to the planting stage, but it doesn't take very much. The next thing I'd like to talk about is uh, selecting a site. So here are a few things that are um, nice to think about early on in the process, depending on how many options you have for where to locate a garden space. Sunlight is a big consideration. Uh, a lot of plants need sunlight for at least seven hours a day in order for the fruit to ripen. Depending on how much sunlight you have, there are some crops that'll do better than others. So most of the warm weather crops that we think of that we eat the fruit from like peppers, tomatoes, those are going to be more reliant on warmer temperatures and more sunlight. Leafy greens are something that you might still be able to grow if you have the only site you have is only partial sunlight. Another consideration is how much air circulation there is. Um, it can be good to have air movement through a garden space and that reduces the amount of disease and pests that can sometimes cause issues for the garden space. Another element to think about is how convenient this garden is to your general pattern of movement in the course of your day. So the whole idea is to be able to consume and harvest and appreciate the space that you're putting work into creating. And I find that the closer it is to the areas that I'm working in already, um, the more likely I am to notice when something needs attention and the more likely I am to be able to keep an eye on what's happening, address it quickly, and also just appreciate it and pick things frequently. Um, sorry about that. Um, so having it you know, in your front yard between places that you're moving around is a great idea instead of having it kind of tucked away in the back. The last element to think about is shape and size of your raised beds. This is something that, um, especially when you're constructing a, a bed um, with boundaries, it can be easy to make it bigger than you can easily reach across, and that makes access really challenging. So it's generally recommended not to have it wider than four feet across. So four feet across is what most people can easily reach across. So you can reach about two feet across from one side, you can walk around to the other side, reach the other half of the crops from the other edge without needing to step or put pressure into the raised bed itself. Um, and that's, that's really helpful. In terms of how long it is, um, that's really up to you. It's nice not to have, it's nice to have places where you can cross through them every so often, just for ease of access again. So um, the, once you have decided on a site that you think is the best fit for a garden in your yard um, or on your property, uh, a good place to start is to um, do a soil test for contaminants such as lead and other heavy metals. 
This is especially important if you're in an urban setting or a suburban setting where there's more um, contamination from roads, from old houses that had lead paint. Um, it can also, however, be a concern in a more rural area. A lot of old orchard sites were heavily treated with arsenic and other heavy metals. And um, there will also be a lot of contamination around old farm sites where there was say a, a kind of informal dump or just old buildings that again had the same um, lead paints on them. So the cooperative extension is a really um, good resource to turn to. They're really affordable and can offer you information about how to go about um, testing the soil and they can also they'll send you a little kit. So that's pictured here. It's a form to fill out about what information you'd like to get back from them and they supply you with a little box to put it in and then they'll send those results back with you and they can help interpret it if you have questions that aren't clear. Uh, another place to look at is the Cumberland County Soil and Water Conservation District. Currently has some funding to help support people in Cumberland County to get um, free lead tests on their property. And so you could check in with them too and see if that's still available. Uh, one thing to know about getting your soil tested is that different levels of lead contamination are healthy for different crops. So it's not necessarily all or nothing. Uh, different types of plants and different portions of the plant will concentrate higher levels than others. So with your test results, you'll often get a suggested list of crops that are safe to grow at the contamination level that your soil is at. So there's places where um, it's not safe to grow leafy greens, such as um, spinach or kale, but it would be um, potentially safe to grow tomato plants and pepper plants because the the plant does not put as many of those contaminants into the fruit as it does into the leaves. So once you figure out what soil you're working with, um, it's time to start figuring out how you would like to construct a garden bed. Um, one note about raised beds is it does not actually have to have a built frame. So the gardens in the larger photograph in the background, those are raised beds, but they do not have a wooden frame around them. They're basically mounded up with distinct pathways between them. If you do decide that you'd like to construct a frame, it does definitely involve a little bit more work and resources. It also makes a big difference in terms of containing all of those materials that you're going to be gathering so that they don't um, erode away and they are really contained and continue to be built up from year to year. So if you have the ability to um, get some materials to build a frame, I do recommend it. Uh, the first inset photograph is the technique that I've found works the best if you're doing it yourself from lumber. And you can see how there are two boards that make up the outside frame. And then there's a third piece in the corner. That third piece, the grain of the wood is going up and down instead of side along um, horizontally. And that means that when you're screwing to that inner um, square piece of wood, you're not going into the end grain of the wood and that's going to make that frame last a lot longer. That's usually the weak point of a lot of garden beds and where they'll fall apart. This is going to hold up longer at, before you need to replace it or repair it. Uh, that wood that's being um, utilized in that first photograph is um, wood that we sourced from somebody who had it available. You can see it's a little thin. Um, the next photograph is a type of lumber that I would recommend um, a little bit more highly if you can get it. And that's something that's at least an inch thick. So something that's one to two inches thick 
and ideally rough sawn, which means that it hasn't been planed smooth. So it's a little bit rougher quality wood, which means it's going to be a little bit more affordable and be a little bit thicker is a good choice for building an outdoor frame. Um, usually like a, a cedar would be the most rot resistant. Other softwoods like pine or spruce or hemlock are also a little bit uh, shorter lived, but definitely a good affordable option to have outside. Um, and then there's also other materials that you can get creative with. You definitely don't need to make it out of purchased squared lumber. Um, I've done them out of uh, poles, you know, like saplings or logs that have been cut. Um, and you can also do it out of pallets. Um, you can make square boxes that are really deep. So those would be like three to three and a half feet high and you can um, attach them into a cube, line it with um, like a, a mulch material, um, like landscape fabric, and then fill it with the materials and you'll get a really nice deep um, self-contained garden. And that can actually be put, if you have um, like really highly contaminated soil, or if you have like a parking lot with extra space in it, um, or a driveway space, that's a great way to get a lot of soil depth with an entirely self-contained structure that's not relying on the ground at all. Something to note if you are using pallets for building a garden bed or a compost pile is to always look and see if you can see where the pallet is stamped. Um, they'll all be stamped with several letters and that um, signals how they've been treated. So every pallet that's shipped needs to be treated to make sure that it's not carrying any bugs or pests from place to place. And sometimes they are treated with chemicals that are really harmful and not something that you want to have in your garden space. So what you're looking for is a stamp that says HT. And HT stands for heat treated. And that pallet has just been brought up to a really high temperature to kill whatever contaminants might be there. And so that poses no risk to having a, a healthy organic growing space. The next um, step that I would recommend taking is to start by laying out your pathways um, to kind of frame the garden beds. Uh, the way that we usually do it looks a little bit different than some of the um, traditional methods of building a garden. So we're putting this installation right on top of the sod. So we're mowing the grass low to begin with, but we're not digging it up, we're leaving it right in place. For the pathways, we are using um, cardboard as our base and then um, putting some wood chips on top of that. So we're using the um, cardboard like you would use landscape fabric. And the purpose of using the cardboard is to create a complete barrier that does not let any light onto the grass. And without light, that sod is going to die and the grass won't grow up through. If we did not put cardboard down, the plants would find the gaps in the wood chips and they would come up very quickly. So it's important to make sure that you are overlapping the cardboard, that you are putting extra pieces down where there's holes or tears. Anywhere that there is a gap, grass will find it. Grass is really good at finding any opportunity to grow. Because we use the cardboard to suffocate the grass, we're able to put a really thin layer of wood chips down. So we usually only put one to two inches of wood chips. Um, the wood chips that you can see on this lower photograph are much higher than that. They're much deeper. They're probably four to six inches. And that's um, not just to suffocate the grass, that's um, intentional to use as a medium to inoculate with um, 
oyster and other types of culinary mushrooms. So that's another um, option that you can use to kind of add in some um, fun and interesting food into your, your garden site um, and have multi-use pathways to utilize those wood chips. Um, a note about the wood chips themselves. Uh, it's great to make sure that you're using something that is undyed and untreated, similar to the pallets. So a lot of the wood chips that you'll see that you can purchase easily from this store are um, treated to look really uniform and they're often um, really poor quality wood that's been chipped and then dyed so that it looks saleable. So if you're able to get a more natural wood chip uh, from an arborist, if sometimes from the city road crews, if they're doing some clearing along your road, you can have them dump a load for you. Um, sometimes the local transfer station supplies them and sometimes a garden center has a version that's sometimes marketed as kid friendly or pet friendly. Um, that just means that it's not treated with any chemicals. So that's something to ask about if you're ordering them from somebody. So the intention of making pathways is to just have really clear delineation of where you'll be walking and where there's access. Um, you can put stepping stones down in that space. You can get creative with the pathways. The idea is that those are permanent from one year to the next. Rowan, I'm just going to jump in with a question yes. that was in the chat. Um, somebody's wondering how wide you would recommend making the pathways. Great question. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, I recommend having the pathways two feet wide. Two feet is a comfortable distance to walk through. It's often kind of also what you would have for a place setting at a table. It's kind of a comfortable distance for a person. It's also wide enough so that you can still move a wheelbarrow through that space and that's convenient for moving materials around. Um, if you have two foot pathways and four foot garden beds, that's a very um, accessible and still efficient use of space to kind of maximize the growing space within an area. Once you have your pathways laid out and you have those permanent spaces where you're going to be walking, the next step is to uh, loosen the soil and um, uh, reduce the compaction within the growing space. So just the act of walking on soil, um, especially mowing soil over many years is packing that down so that there's less air in the soil and less channels for water and nutrients to be moving um, through the sod. So there's a few different ways to loosen that soil and create those air and water channels. So on the left is the more specialized tool to do that. This is called a broad fork. And you can see in this photograph, there's two different styles. So the one in the front is designed, it's a little bit more rugged and it's great for hard pack soil um, or anything that's really rocky. Uh, the tines are very strong and are not going to bend. There's a second model in the background here that um, is designed for lighter soils that uh, maybe are not as hard packed to begin with. And um, those are basically operated. You can see somebody um, putting it into practice when we were building out new community garden sites in the Libby Town neighborhood of Portland. And you basically stand on it, work it into the soil, and then you pull back on it very slightly. Again, you're not trying to flip the soil, you're not trying to disrupt it or disturb the ecology that's happening under the sod. You're just trying to kind of lift it and loosen it a little bit, and then pull the tool back about six inches and do it again until you've kind of thoroughly gone over that whole space. You can definitely still do this without a broad fork. So on the right hand side of the screen, that's the spading fork that um, was mentioned earlier. And that's a less specialized tool. So it takes longer because it's smaller. So you'll need more um, times of placing it in the garden to cover the whole space, but it's very doable. And again, just standing on it, getting it 
worked into the ground as deeply as you can, wiggling it around to loosen up the soil. Um, and then just being very mindful once you've done this step to then try to not stand in it or put heavy things down in the soil, that you're really trying to keep that soil um, uncompacted. So um, with no till, it only works if you're also not compacting the soil. If you compact the soil a lot, then um, you're kind of restricting the amount of oxygen and water channels and need to kind of fluff it back up again. So the next stage is to, so all kind of the foundation and the prep work is complete at this point. And now it's time to start layering in materials. So um, Rowan, this, yes. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, if Not I could jump in with one other question from the chat sure. that goes back a slide or two, but somebody just was wondering about preventing the wood planks if you're using wood planks um, from rotting, if there's anything you mm -hmm. suggest. So um, there are several reasons why wood rots. So um, contact with soil is one. Um, so like the moisture that's held against the wood with being in contact with soil and also um, being in the sunlight, the UV can also break it down. So there are some types of wood that are more stable in those conditions. Cedar would definitely be the best and would last the longest and be the most resistant to rotting away. And um, something like a spruce or hemlock would probably be the second best option uh, because of the sap content in the woods, it, it's a little bit more resistant to breaking down than say like a hardwood, like a maple. Um, I generally don't, and also like the thicker the board, the longer it's going to take it to degrade. So you'll get a lot more years of life out of a, a wider board than you would out of a narrow board. A one inch or half inch board is going to rot much more quickly. I don't recommend treating them with anything um, that doesn't, that, tend to prolong the life that much and can cause issues with contaminating the soil as a side effect. Um, okay, so once you've got that frame built um, and you're ready to fill it in, instead of just going and purchasing uh, many yards of compost or topsoil, this can get really expensive for one thing um, and it can also uh, work fairly well but it's not a really rich um, nutritious combination of um, of nutrients for the plants that you'll be growing so this is a technique that's really building a lot more kind of coarse organic material that's then breaking down in place over several years and is really feeding those plants over the long run so the general idea is to balance green uh, materials, which are high in nitrogen, and brown materials, which are high in carbon. So this balance of nitrogen and carbon is um, similar to what you would uh, hear when people are talking about how to build a compost pile that's not going to smell and that's going to break down really, um, really well over time. So uh, the idea is to um, use what you have available. This is kind of what we've worked with and it's flexible. So you can plug in materials that you might have access to. It's okay if you leave one of these things out. Um, it's a very kind of flexible idea that can be adapted to suit what you have available to you. Regardless of what you're putting into this space, it's a good idea just to know where your sources are coming from. So think about what has gone into that material over its lifetime and make sure that you're comfortable bringing that into your garden. So um, like if you're taking materials from a yard, you wanna make sure that that yard hasn't been sprayed with pesticides or herbicides. If you're getting materials um, from 
other sources, even if you're getting manure, you might want to try to find an organic farm to get that manure from rather than somewhere that might have a lot of antibiotics that are carried into the soil that you're creating. Okay, so here we go. Here are all of the layers that we can go through from the ground up. So number one, over on the top left of the screen, is granite dust. And this is an unusual material. You probably wouldn't think to start building a garden with stone. So this is a material that is a byproduct of stone cutting companies. If there's somebody who is making anything out of like marble or granite in your area, they're usually happy to part with a bucket of stone dust. It is incredibly heavy, so a small amount is all that you can really handle and that's all you really need. So this isn't something that we're putting a lot on. Um, this is something that we're just sprinkling a few handfuls across the space. The reason that we're doing this is that many of our soils are really depleted. So a lot of the minerals have been leached out of them over the years. And this is a way to bring those minerals back into the soil. So stone has a lot of trace minerals present in it. And if you spread these back into the gardens um, on that bottom layer, the plants are then going to be able to take that up and it's going to benefit their growth. And it's also going to benefit our health if um, there is a mineral or element that's not in the soil, that's not going to be in the plant, and then that's not going to be in our diet. So we can, that can show up as um, a, an issue, a lack that we have as well. So that's a really great thing to get into the ground and that's kind of a one-time treatment that'll last a long time. If you're using manure, uh, that would be the next layer that I would recommend. So manure is a material that you wanna be a little cautious working with because it can cause some health issues if you get um, food contaminated with manure that is too fresh. So ideally you want to let it sit for a little while before you start harvesting and eating directly from gardens that have manure, um, at least fresh manure that's used on them. Um, you can get away with it in this if you put it on the bottom and you layer a lot of material on top of it so that you're not eating um, directly from food that's been in contact with the manure. Um, it's ideal to kind of do any manure treatments on your garden in the fall in the future and let them sit over the course of the winter to really let that age before you're planting into it. Um, also, I can, yeah. Sorry, I'm just going to jump in with a couple questions about some mm -hmm. of the things you've already mentioned. Um, one person is wondering with cardboard in the, the pathways, are you worried about removing metal staples and tape and stickers? And are you worried about printing that's on the cardboard? Great questions. Um, we do try to take all of the tape off, that is not going to break down and that those bits of plastic are going to either break down and cause um, microplastics to get into the soil or just kind of be an aesthetic um, issue. So it's nice to get those out and put those right into the trash. I don't usually worry about staples. They're so small that they seem to break down really quickly and I've never had issues with stepping on them or finding them surface. Um, I haven't worried about uh, the amount of ink that's on it. Um, we don't usually use it in the garden itself. Um, and so there, it depends on the cardboard, like there, there are some glues that are used and there are some inks that are used. Most of the time, those are not terribly harmful. Most of them break down um, as part of the decomposition process into forms that aren't harmful to human health. So they're not usually a contamination concern. Um, Great. 
And then just yeah. one other question. Um, Somebody is wondering if something like azomite would be able to replace granite dust, if you know about that. Yes. So azomite, the A to Z of um, remineralization is kind of a very similar product that you can buy. So that would be a great substitute. Um, another um, quick point for manure, um, it's depending on the animal, um, it has, some of it has seeds that are still viable, weed seeds. So if you get cow manure, um, it's not going to re-sprout as readily as horse manure. So if you have horse manure, um, that's likely to regrow all of the lovely grasses that were in the horse's diet and in the hay that that horse was consuming. So with products like that, that might have weed seeds, you just wanna bury them at least four inches deep. So seeds, like we were talking about with putting the cardboard down to block the light on the pathways, one of the things that plants need in order to germinate and grow is sunlight. And if you put at least four inches of material, of dense material on top of them, those seeds are going to stay dormant. They are not going to regrow until they come up close to the light. So as long as you put them down low, pile up multiple inches on top of them, they're not gonna cause you any maintenance issues for your garden space. This is another reason why no-till is lower maintenance because when you're tilling the soil, you're continually bringing seeds that are waiting for sunlight up to the surface where they can start growing and you're continually replenishing that bank of weeds that then you need to pull out around your vegetables. Uh, leaf mulch is a really great resource because it's readily available. Um, you can use, it's great if it's sat for a little while and started to decompose. I've also used fresher leaves, ideally uh, chip them up, run them through your lawnmower or something so that they are smaller pieces and they're less likely to create mats. That's usually what we use for the bulk of our um, bed construction. You can also use grass clippings. Um, again, bury those a little bit deeper, at least four inches so that you don't have any weed issues. Um, seaweed is an incredible resource. If you're lucky enough to live close to the coast, uh, seaweed is really high in a lot of minerals and nutrients as well, and can bring a lot um, of nutrients into the garden space. Once you have the majority of your bed filled up to the height that you'd like, um, keeping in mind that the materials will settle over time, that's when we recommend finishing it off with a thin layer of finished sifted compost. So this is usually the only material that we're buying in and paying for. And this we spread just an inch or two on the top. And that's because it's a finer material. And so it's easier for young plants to get established in. After we have it nice and even with the finished compost, we lay newspaper over it. Um, this is creating another layer of carbon. It's also one of our layers of mulch. And the combination of the newspaper and the hay is what we use uh, to provide mulch and cover the soil so that it's not exposed. And what that means is water is staying in and weeds are staying out. So that's a really important element of keeping these gardens really low maintenance. Kind of the majority of garden work can be watering and weeding. So if you can prevent those tasks or reduce them, you're going to spend a lot less time needing to maintain the garden space. Uh, the newspaper we um, also use because the hay has weed seeds in it, so it's different from straw. Hay is mowed out of a field, and so it's everything that would naturally be growing in that field space. Straw is just the stems of a crop of grain. So we use hay instead of straw because it's easier to find locally, it's easier to find organic, it's uh, more affordable, 
and it also is more nutritious, so it's adding more to the soil. Uh, because it has weed seeds, uh, spreading the newspaper underneath it is preventing those seeds from landing in the soil and sprouting. So as long as you put a careful layer of newspaper down, uh, that shouldn't be an issue, it shouldn't regrow. With newspaper, similar to the question that was brought up about cardboard, it is important to know uh, what type of ink your local newspaper uses. So a lot of newspapers use soy-based inks, which are um, fine for our health, but not all of them. So if they're using a more chemical-based ink, it's better to avoid putting them on the garden. You can also use like a roll of brown paper, works fine. Um, watering the different layers can help things, can speed up the process of them kind of breaking down, and it can also help hold them in place, especially that final layer of hay. Um, it's nice to water it so that it doesn't blow away. It, the breeze comes up before it really settles. So planting into mulch can look a little bit different uh, because there's a covering on the soil. Uh, what we do is we just um, part the mulch in the paper and uh, make a little opening. And then we take a couple of handfuls of that finished compost and we place that in the hole or along the row and then place the seedlings or the seeds right into that. So they're kind of nestled down a little bit um, so that the hay is up around them. So in these photographs, we're doing that before putting the hay on. You can also do it after putting the hay on. And if you don't have hay, you can definitely also use straw and you can also use leaves or seaweed as that final layer of mulch. It's basically any material that's just covering the soil so you're not leaving it open. Um, if you think of open soil as kind of like a open um, abrasion on your skin, your skin wants to heal back over that wound and um, gardens and nature is kind of the same way. If there's open soil, it's going to want to cover that up. So if, if you cover it up with a mulch, then it's not going to get covered and filled in with weeds. Rowan, I'm just gonna yes. throw in one more question from the chat. Mm -hmm. um, somebody's asking, would you recommend creating these beds every spring or the fall before planting? And if you're layering the manure the fall before planting, as you recommended, should you wait to layer the rest of the materials until the spring? So once you go through this process, these beds shouldn't need to have anything else added to them for multiple years. So you can usually go three to four years without adding anything else because there's so much nutrients that's gradually breaking down throughout those years. So um, I often still will top dress it. I'll add a layer of seaweed or a layer of leaves in the fall just to kind of keep building it up but that's definitely not necessary. Um, you can, I think, ideally you would build a garden bed in the fall, wait for it to age and break down a little bit, plant it in the spring. However, we have um, frequently just built a garden and started planting into it immediately and it's been fine. So um, we've finished a project in August and gone straight into planting some late season crops that fall and they did beautifully. So um, I definitely don't think you have to wait. It can really be done any time of the year. Um, now would be a great time if you have um, access to getting materials safely right now, you could construct this and plant into it for this year. Um, if you wanted to, because you're burying that manure deeply, that would be okay. Um, if you wanted to add manure in the future to kind of boost the nitrogen in the soil, that's when I would really recommend doing it in the fall, not in the spring. So all of these same materials and techniques can be um, adapted to growing in containers. So uh, some of the main hurdles of growing in containers is a lack of space and a lack of consistent watering. So 
honestly, I find that growing in a container is harder than growing in a garden space, even though it's much smaller, just because it needs more constant care. So this is a technique that I found that um, really creates a higher success rate. And it's maybe not the most aesthetically pleasing container, but they're very practical and the plants do really well in them. So um, using five gallon buckets, you can uh, put two of them together and um, forgive my, my very quick Google Slides drawing, <laughs> uh, but hopefully it'll give you the general idea of um, how to insert one bucket into it, the other. And what you'll find is because the rim is wider, one of them will stay about four inches above the bottom of the outer bucket. These arrows represent where to drill holes for drainage. So if you drill holes into the bottom of one bucket and then drill holes in the outside of the second bucket, just below where that inner bucket is going to uh, rest, what you're going to have is kind of a false bottom with a reservoir of water. So when you water it from the top, that water can percolate down through that first bucket that's full of uh, all those great lasagna uh, layers. And then excess water will pool in the bottom and uh, it can slowly evaporate up and keep this um, planter from running out of water and drying out. Uh, having those holes in the outside of the outer bucket allows any um, excess water, if it gets too full, it'll still drain out so that the roots are not sitting in water, which is awful, often harmful for plants. So the pros and cons, just to kind of circle back to where we started, um, this method definitely takes a lot more upfront labor. Uh, it can also create habitat for some pests in particular, because there's a lot of organic matter uh, grubs um, like to eat unbroken down organic matter so they can sometimes show up and it also creates a really lovely ecosystem for slugs and snails. So those are some of the concerns that um, you might want to just be alert and aware of. Uh, but for me the pros definitely outweigh the list of cons. Um, creating really healthy soil the high productivity that it leads to, the low cost and um, positive ecological impact, and then the low maintenance, really reducing the amount of weeds and watering needs. So this is a picture of that first garden that we looked at when it was just being constructed. It gives you a little sense of the jungle that these spaces can turn into. So, um, I've definitely found that I need to space things a little farther apart because they grow so well. So that's um, what I have to share with you and um, I'd be happy to answer any further questions or hear what others have to share before we go. Thanks Rowan. Um, there are a couple questions in the chat box that I'll share. Um, first, Juanita is wondering how many holes would you put in the bottom bucket for the container method? Uh, it depends on how big the holes you are drilling are. So depending on the drill bit you have, if you have a really small drill bit, you'll need more holes. Ideally, you'd have like half inch to one inch holes, so pretty big so that quite a bit of water can pass out of the bucket. And if you have those larger holes, I would say like four to six. Okay, great. Um, and Kathleen is wondering, are there any contraindications to putting a bed on top of a leach field? Yes. So um, I've honestly heard different opinions about this. Um, Leach fields definitely do grow incredibly robust plants. There's a lot of nitrogen and a lot of nutrients that are coming out. Um, there are some 
health concerns. Um, some people think that take that more seriously than others. Um, and there can also be some, some people are concerned about um, negative impacts to the leach field itself. So definitely not wanting to grow anything with robust roots. Um, I tend to uh, grow uh, maybe a flower bed there or something that's not edible um, and lean towards that over a leach field area where contamination might be an issue and then um, not, not plant the, the garden crops there. Okay, we have more questions coming in. Um, one person is wondering about grubs and slugs. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have any recommendations for what you should do if they appear? Um, and I'll also mention that we're gonna talk all about all kinds of pests next month too. Yeah, definitely a really um, great topic to revisit. There's so much information about pests and different approaches to um, controlling them. One of the best methods that I've found is to create beer traps. So for some reason, slugs really cannot resist the smell of beer. And if you put a little container um, out in the garden and cover it so that it doesn't get um, uh, watered down when it rains, the slugs will all basically drown themselves. And that's an efficient way to carry them out. If you do this technique, it's important to um, create a lip around the beer that is at least an inch tall, uh, because otherwise you'll end up catching some insects that are actually beneficial to the gardens will also fall into that space. If you have it an inch off the ground, you'll prevent that side effect. Okay, great. Um, and another question about the layering method. Um, do you need to replace the newspaper layer each year as it decomposes? So if you are using an alternative top layer of mulch, if you were using straw or leaves or seaweed, you could skip that layer of newspaper. If you are going to return and put a new layer of hay on your garden, or sometimes even straw will regrow and re-sprout depending on the source, so if you're worried about something uh, regrowing, that's when I would reapply the newspaper. Great. Um, and a question about the end of the season. Um, what do you suggest doing with the old dead plants on top of the beds? Um, do you recommend letting them rot right there on the beds or clearing them out? Great question. Um, and that could be a whole nother webinar at the end of the season about cleaning up and getting your uh, garden put to bed. Uh, what I usually do is definitely remove anything that's diseased or sick. Oftentimes that will regenerate in the back end of the soil the following year, depending on what it is. So um, if you're not sure, it might be best just to take that out of the life cycle of the garden space. Anything that's healthy, I do leave right in place, but I, um, I chop it up. So I cut it back at the ground. I don't pull up those plants by the roots and I chop them up into small pieces. The smaller the pieces, the faster it's going to decompose and then it'll be mostly gone by the spring and it'll just keep feeding the soil. Great. Um, we've got a question from Todd. If planting a freshly made bed with actively decomposing materials, is there potential for root issues or diseases? And he's wondering if the carbon steals the nitrogen. So um, the carbon will steal some of the nitrogen. So that's why it's good to try to balance those two elements. Most of the materials that we talked about are not high enough in carbon to be a main concern. Something like the wood chips that we talked about using in the pathways, those really coarse, really pure carbon sources would leach quite a bit of nitrogen away. So we don't want to put those right in the garden bed. They're fine in the pathway. They're going to break down pretty independently, but we wouldn't want to put those in the vegetable garden. Um, 
there is so one of one of the root issues that can happen is that those grubs um, can live in the soil and then they would attack the roots. Um, I haven't seen that be an issue very often. And um, the main way to avoid having rot or decay on your roots would be to make sure that it all warms up enough before planting into it. So um, taking a meat thermometer or a, a soil thermometer and sticking that in and reading your seed packets to see what the recommended um, temperature is for putting those plants into the soil will really make sure that they're um, going to be healthy and it's not going to stay really wet and cold, which are the um, the the um, factors that would lead to decay and rot. Great, that makes sense. Um, a couple questions from Melissa. Um, she's wondering, is it really best to just loosen the grass in the garden beds before layering over them, or should you think about removing the grass altogether? So, and, oh, here, yeah, yeah, you answer that one. So okay. I'll pass the second. I used to take the soy, the sod out. I used to remove it. Um, it's a lot of work, and um, but I didn't mind because I thought that it was beneficial over the long run. What I have learned since is that the garden is never as productive as the first year that it goes in. And a lot of that is because the sod itself, the grass is really nutritious. There's a lot of nitrogen um, in that really dense growing medium of compact grass. And so that's actually really beneficial to the first year of the garden. Wow. Um, and the second question she asked, is it okay to use mulch on top of the newspaper layer instead of hay or straw? So that might be, I, I am guessing it might be like the wood chip mulch that you are alluding to. So correct me if that's not what you were thinking. Um, and that goes back to that last question about the, um, the carbon and that that is a really coarse material that takes a long time to break down and takes a lot of nitrogen out of the soil in order to um, go through the breaking down process. And so that's not something that you'd wanna put in a garden bed. It's something that's great to put around trees and shrubs um, that don't need that really concentrated amount of, of nitrogen to feed them in the short season. Okay, great. Yeah, Melissa said that is what she was thinking of. Um, and I think that's all the questions we have that have come in to the chat box. Uh, oh, here's one more. Um, asking if it's okay to use the pre-made garden bed soil instead. I don't know if that's instead of the compost layer or instead of some of the layers. Right, so though there are advantages to using all of these different sources of materials from all these different places, it can also be a little overwhelming or hard to access them, especially if you are, you know, don't have access to a vehicle that's easy to transport uh, bulk materials around in. So it is fine to um, just use uh, kind of what you would order from a garden center to fill these raised beds instead. Um, I would recommend like a 50-50 mix. So it's usually like 50% uh, topsoil and 50% compost. That's usually a pretty good balance. And then I'd, there's still elements of what we talked about that you could implement with that. So I'd still recommend placing mulch on top, um, creating permanent walkways so that you're not compacting the soil. Um, those things would still be relevant and could be applied. That's great, Ron. Thanks. Um, a lot of people are uh, thanking you for the presentation. And we have one question here um, about seeding. Mm -hmm. um, is there, do you have any recommendations about where to seed if you don't have access to a greenhouse? And do you usually transplant or do you direct seed as well? So I can give a brief answer and then I, I encourage you to come back and check in with Mafka for their next workshop. I'm sure there will be a lot more information about that. Um, 
I do both. So my very general um, rule of thumb is if it's something that you eat the roots from, the carrots, uh, beets, these types of things do not like to be disturbed once they're started. And so those are plants that I always directly seed into the garden itself outside. If it's something that I eat the leaves from, lettuce, kale, collards, those can usually go either way. You can start them inside and move them outside or you can plant them directly. If you eat the fruit, so the peppers, tomatoes, um, those, the fruit is the last thing to develop on a plant that takes a really long time. And those are usually the plants that need the head start to uh, grow inside for a few weeks before it's warm enough to move them outside. Um, so both of those methods could work really well um, for these lasagna layered garden spaces. Um, you can start them, if you don't have a greenhouse, you can get some um, fluorescent lights, um, which is what I do and I have a very basic setup in my apartment. Um, you can also start a few things in front of a window or on a windowsill, um, as long as you have a sunny spot. That works well too. And you can also always find another farmer or grower in your area and support them by purchasing a few seedlings. Awesome, thanks Rowan. Um, unless anybody has any last questions, um, I think we'll, we'll tie things up there. Thank you so much for, for coming and sharing with us. This has been really great. Thanks for having me, it's been a pleasure. Thank you all for being here. And please let me know if you have any follow-up questions. I'd be happy to be in touch with you.